then let's open up our Bibles together to 2 Kings chapter 4. 2 Kings chapter 4, and I want to talk to you today about how to remain fully filled when you are continually, perpetually pouring yourself out to others. How do you stay fulfilled when you're continuing to give of yourself to others? So I want to share a message with you that I'm entitling, There's More Where That Came From. And let's pray and ask God to bless this time that we have to be together in his word. Father, thank you once again for this moment in time that we can be together to open your word. For we know that your word will accomplish the purpose in which it was sent. Lord, so we pray that your word would take root within our hearts, transforming our lives. Make us more like you and less like ourselves. We thank you, God, for your love, for your grace, and for your mercy. And so, Lord, as we look to you now, would we see you clearly? Would we hear your still and quiet voice? For we are here to hear from you. Bless this time that we have to be together in your word. In Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people say, amen. amen. Life is full of demands. Whether that's true for you presently or you'll experience that sometime in the near future, you will find that in life, that life is completely demanding, whether it's the responsibilities or the appointments or the commitments, whatever it may be, the needs that you have or that others have around you, the responsibilities that have to be accomplished, the obligations that have to be fulfilled, even the commitments that you didn't even commit yourself to, but because you're involved with somebody, you're now committed to them. And now you find yourself full of demands. And so you pour out yourself trying to give of yourself to meet the needs and to help others and to continually pour out and pour out. But there comes a point in all of our lives where we feel that we have nothing left to give. I've given and I've given and I've given, but now I, I don't have any more time. I don't have any more resources. I don't have any more energy. I don't have anything more left to give. After all, every person only has so much to pour out before they run out. And it seems like there's always someone that is in need, whether it's a spouse or the children or the boss or the job or the person at church that always has a need, that always finds you somehow at church when you're always trying to hide on the other side of the sanctuary. And someone always needs something, and then there's ministry commitments and responsibilities, and there's just so much going on. So what do you do? Well, I want to show you today from our text what God can do through you as you continue to pour out. It's 2 Kings chapter 4. Let's begin in verse 1 together. It says, A certain woman of the wives of the sons of the prophets cried out to Elisha, saying, your servant, my husband, is dead. And you know that your servant feared the Lord. And the creditor is coming to take my two sons to be his slaves. So Elisha said to her, verse 2, What shall I do for you? Tell me, what do you have in the house? And she said, Your maidservant has nothing in the house but a jar of oil. In our text today, we see a woman whose husband served Elisha the prophet as an assisting prophet. He was faithful to the ministry and what God had called him to do, but now he died. And the widow now is having a difficult time making ends meet to provide for her family. So she's sold everything. She's cleared out her house. There's no furniture left. There's no clothes left. There's not even any food left in the house. She literally has nothing left to give, to provide, to pour out for her sons, for her family. 
And she's trying to do everything she possibly can to hold her family together, to keep her family together. She already lost her husband, and now she's about to lose her two sons to the creditor. For you see, in that day, if you were in debt and you couldn't pay your debt, that the creditor could enslave those who were able to work to pay off the debt. The problem was there were dishonest creditors where they would pay you less than the interest on your debt. So your debt would only grow and grow and grow where you would be enslaved for the rest of your life. And now this woman, seeing her family beginning to fall apart, her house start to fall apart, not knowing what to, to, to do. She's tried to do everything she possibly can do. What more can I do? I, I've poured out all that I can do and it seems like it's not enough. I've given all that I can give and it seems like it's not enough. I can't do any more and there's still greater needs. The demand is greater than the supply. And she came up short. And now, as everything is gone, literally with nothing left to give, she cries out to Elisha. She goes to Elisha and, and she says, the creditor is going to enslave my, my children. I have nothing left. And you remember my husband, he, he served faithfully. She turned to uh, Elisha for some help. And Elisha asked her this question, what do you have in your home? And she says, I have nothing left. I have nothing left but a little jar of oil. Now, the jar of oil that she had, from, from the text we know it would have, was a small jar, a very limited amount of oil from the original text in the original language. We know it's just a little bit of oil. And this oil, don't think of it as a uh, cooking oil, but the process to extract the oil from the olive was an extremely expensive process in that day. And so it would have been of great value of what she had. But not only was it of great value financially, but it must have meant something to her personally. For she was willing to sell all of her furniture and not have a bed to sleep on and have no clothes and have nothing left but a jar of oil. Perhaps it was because when her husband died, the oil that often would use would be a, a perfume, a, an anointing oil, an oil that would be as used in the burial process. Perhaps it was the last memory she had of her husband. The last thing that she, she had before he was put into the ground. Whatever it was, we know that it meant a lot to her. It was the last thing that she had that she was willing to let go of. And so she says, I have nothing else but this little jar of oil. I have only a little bit of it. So Elisha hears that response and says to her in verse 3, Go, borrow vessels from everywhere, from all your neighbors, empty vessels. Do not gather just a few. And when you've come in, you shall shut the door behind you and your sons. Then pour into all those vessels and set aside the full ones. So, verse 5, she went from him and shut the door behind her and her sons, who brought the vessels to her, and she poured it out. Now it came to pass, when the vessels were full, that she said to her son, bring me another vessel. And he said to her, there is not another vessel. So the oil ceased. Then, verse 7, she came and told the man of God, and he said, Go sell the oil and pay your debt, and you and your sons live on the rest. From this text, there's three things that I want us to see today. Three things, more than just three points of a sermon. Three applications, three important principles that we each need to understand as believers in Jesus. The first that I want us to see today Number one, when you see what you don't have, God sees 
what you do have. You might want to write that down if you're taking notes. When you see what you don't have, God sees what you do have. All this woman could focus on is what she didn't have, what was gone, what she no longer had to give. But Elisha, on the other hand, he focuses on what she still had left to give. We, like this widow, often focus on the things that we've lost, the things that we don't have, the things that we no longer have, the people that are no longer with us anymore, the people that have left us, abandoned us, no longer there to support us. We focus on the the money that we no longer have and the investments that have gone south, the relationships that are gone. But God isn't stuck on what we don't have to give him. God is interested in what we do have. You see, instead of focusing on the people that are, are gone, God focuses on the people that are still there. God isn't looking at what we don't have in resources. God sees what we do have. And in every situation, we so easily can get caught up in looking at all the things that we don't have and what we can't do when God is only interested in what we do have and what we can do. You see, God isn't stuck on what we don't have. Like, I don't know if I can even use you anymore after that one. God isn't saying, I I, I don't know how we're going to work this one out. You really messed things up. God isn't bothered with that, stuck on that. And what she had left was the very thing, was the vessel in which God worked the miracle. And what you have to give to God can be the vessel, the instrument, the tool in which God will use to bring about the miracle. I think of men and women throughout the Bible that God used in powerful ways. Often, they were unable to do what God was calling them to do, but God chose them and then would give them what they would need to accomplish the task at hand. Think of Moses. When God called Moses in Exodus chapter 4, God called Moses to deliver The people of Israel, God's chosen people out of bondage from Egypt. But Moses had all the reasons why he couldn't do it. I I can't do that. I, uh, I, I, um, 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 I, uh, stammer. And God, I can't be your spokesperson because I have a stuttering problem. So God, I can't, I can't, you can't use me to, to do this. I've lim- I'm limited, God. I- I've just been a shepherd out here for 40 years. I don't know what's going on in Egypt anymore. God, I- I'm not your guy. And God asked Moses one question in Exodus chapter 4, verse 2. He said, what is that in your hand? And Moses said, a staff. And God said, okay, then I will use what you do have. And how did God use what Moses did have? Because as long as what you have, as long as what I have, as long as what we have in our hands, we give to God, God will use what is in our hands. And boy, how did God use it to bring about the plagues that would deliver the people out of Egypt. In the parting of the Red Sea, he said to raise the staff into the air. Or even when it came to the battle against the Amalekites, Moses would go up onto the mountain and raise the staff up. And as long as he held it up, Victory would come their way. God will use what you have as long as what you have is for God. But not only Moses, but God has a reputation of using what little we have to do with what only God could do. And I love that about God. Because throughout the Bible, we see people being used over and over and over again, whether it was a widow who gave two mites, who God said, I'll use that. Or a boy who just had a sack lunch of five loaves and two fish, but he put it in Jesus' hands. And when he took what he had and he gave it to God, God used what he had. Whether it's Samson with the jawbone of a donkey, God will say, I'll use that to defeat a thousand of the enemy. 
or whether it was Moses with his walking stick. God will use what you have as long as what you have is for God. And so, so the widow is there. She doesn't have anything left except a little jar of oil. But the profound truth that we need to begin embracing today is that all God needs to work the miracle in your life is what you already have. What do you have in your vessel? What has God given to you? What has he entrusted with you as his steward? What vessel, what life, what is it that God has given to you? Our God, listen, who created this universe out of nothing can take the very little that you have and to use it to accomplish his purposes for his plan to work his will out in your life and in my life to fulfill his plan. Do you believe that, church? So when you see what you don't have, remember, God sees what you do have. Number two, if you keep pouring out, God will keep filling you up. This woman had very little left to give. She didn't have enough resources for her children, for her home. She was, it would be safe to say she had very little of anything really left. But what she had very little of, God would use. So Elisha says in verse 3, Go borrow vessels from everywhere, from all of your neighbors, empty vessels. Do not gather just a few. Gather all the vessels you can find and start pouring. Now this woman had a choice to make. She could say, well, that's stupid because I have very little left, and this wouldn't even fit one, fill one vessel, let alone many vessels. So I don't see how my resource is going to meet the need. I don't see how that's going to be possible. Or the second option she had was to be obedient to what God was telling her to do through the prophet Elisha. And as this woman was obedient and as she gathered those vessels in her home and did exactly what she was told to do out of obedience, she saw God do what only God could do. God brought about a miracle because she was obedient. She saw God do what he desired to do. For as long as she poured out that oil, God kept filling that vessel up. As she was pouring, God was filling. Now most of us realize today that there's only so much that we can pour out until we have nothing left to give. Where we pour out and meet the needs and perhaps you felt that this way before where you've done all that you can do and it's still not enough. Have you ever felt like there's not enough time in the day? Raise your hand if you've ever come to a point where you just wish you had another hour or two in the day. If you're not raising your hand, you're lying in church right now. (laughs) It seems often there's not enough time in the day to get everything done that we need to get done in the day. There's limited time or perhaps you haven't had enough finances to cover the expenses and the finances are limited and you just don't seem like you have enough and you're working the second job and you're doing all that you can do to meet the needs of those around you, but it doesn't seem like there's enough and you do everything you can to hold everything together, to pour into every person that that needs you, that has need of you, that is demanding from you. It just doesn't seem like enough. If you're a parent, you know that's especially true with your children, especially if you have young children. My, I have three kids. One is five, my daughter is three, and my son, my youngest, is about to be two. I had three kids that were three and under, all three in diapers at the same time. I understand the demands of, of the family, and so here you are, and you have your, your kids, and, and they're always needing something from you. And so you look at what you have to give and it just doesn't seem like it's ever going to be enough to meet the needs of your children. 
because of the demands that they have for you. Mom, drive me here. Dad, I need this. And mom, dad, ah, 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 ah. Are you kidding me? I only got this. And I'm supposed to fill that? But maybe, just maybe I could, if it was only the kids. But for you wives to say, yeah, I don't only take care of the kids. I have to take care of the home too. Maybe this for you men or women, it's your job or your second job. And, and now you're looking at it like, how, how am I supposed to not only meet the needs of the children, but also take care of the responsibilities at home and the job when I only have this. But then on top of the kids and the job, now you're taking care of the mother-in-law. <laughs> and this, this cracked pot. <laughs> this cracked pot has a hole in the bottom of it. And how am I supposed to fill that? Because it doesn't matter how much I give, it's never enough. <laughs> Always need something more, it's never good enough because there's a hole in the bottom. <laughs> then there's your husband. expect what from me? <laughs> you expect me to do what? And, 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 oh yeah, yeah, take care of the kids, yeah, and, and do the home, and, and yeah, and the mother-in-law, and, and, and like God, this wasn't enough? <laughs> and here we are, God, I can't do this. I'm giving all that I have to give, and it just doesn't seem like it's enough, and like Perhaps this widow, you go before God and cry out, I have nothing left, God. I've done all that I can do. And, and God, I've done everything, and it just doesn't seem like it's enough. And God replies to you like Elisha did to that woman and says to you today, but what do you have? What do you have? And God's asking that question to you today, not that he doesn't know the answer to it, but it's because he wants you to know the answer to it. It's a rhetorical question. What do you have? You see, oil in the Old Testament is symbolic of one thing, the Holy Spirit. And God is looking at your life and he says, okay, yeah, you're limited on time and resources and energy and health and whatever else it may be, but what is it that you do have? And for each of us who is a believer here today in Jesus Christ and has received him as our personal Lord and Savior, God's asking you that question so that you would realize what you do have. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 7, talking about the Holy Spirit says that we have this treasure in earthen vessels or in jars of clay. Talking about the Holy Spirit says we have a treasure, the Holy Spirit, within us. And throughout the Bible, our lives are likened to vessels. And you are this vessel this is you today. And God would say, there's one thing that you need to realize that you have within you, and that is the Holy Spirit. And the word of the Lord for Calvary Chapel, Chino Valley today is this, as long as you keep pouring out, God will keep filling you up. For as long as this woman was pouring out, God kept filling her up. And as long as you keep pouring out your life, notice Elisha told her, don't just get a few vessels. Don't just grab a few, but grab as many as you can find. For most of us, it's like having the least amount of responsibilities and demands, the better it is. 
But Elisha tells her to grab as many vessels as she possibly can find. For as she poured out, the Holy Spirit, the oil, would be filling, perpetually overflowing. What does the Bible say that God will do in our lives? He will pour out His Spirit, overflowing, leaving us fully filled. And then those vessels, those empty jars that are around us, will also reap the overflowing until they are all filled. And so that woman began pouring out. And as she poured out, God worked a miracle and continued to fill that vessel back up. You see, as long as we are pouring out into other vessels, your husband, your children, the people around you, whatever it may be, the vessels that God has gathered around you, the spirit who is called the helper will be helping you, sustaining you, providing for you, strengthening you, and helping you to do all that God has called you to do. And so God brought me here to tell you, although there might be some big vessels and a lot of responsibility, God brought me here to tell you, there's more where that comes from. God is the great provider. He is our sustenance. He is our abundance. And God will continue to give us all that we need to meet the needs through the Holy Spirit. All we have to do is keep pouring out. There's more where that came from. And Paul would say to the Philippian congregation in chapter 4 verse 19 and my God shall supply all your needs through his glorious riches in Christ Jesus God will do it as long as we do what God's call us to do we'll see God do what we never knew was possible and so pour out Listen, oftentimes when there's needs, there's demands, we think, ah, oh, poor me. And that's exactly right. Not out of self-pity, but as of a prayer. God, pour me. God, use me as a vessel to impact the lives and the people around me. So the question is posed, just like it was to that woman the instruction was given to go and gather vessels around you and begin pouring out. And as long as she had empty vessels, the oil continued filling. But do you know when the oil stopped flowing? When every vessel around her was filled. When every need was met. When every demand was fulfilled, when every responsibility was accomplished, when every obligation was completed, God gave to her what she needed to see every empty vessel filled. It says in verse 6, Now it came to pass when the vessels were full that she said to her son, Bring me another vessel. And he said to her, There is not another vessel. So the oil ceased. You see, when we continue to pour out, God will continue to fill. And as God fills us, overflowing with the Spirit, He'll continue to do so until we stop pouring out. If you want God to fill you overflowing continually, perpetually, here's the key, continually, perpetually be pouring yourself out. Because God looks at your life as a vessel, a conduit in which his blessings can flow through you to others. Let me put it to you this way. What God gives to you isn't solely for you, isn't meant to stay with you. God gives to you to be able to give through you to bless others. 
And so when we continue to pour out our lives and to give of ourselves, whatever it is that God has given to us to meet the needs of people around us, God looks at a man like that, a woman like that, and says, I can use a person like that. And I'll continue to give that person abundantly above and beyond anything they could ever think or imagine because I know that I will be able to provide through them But listen, here's when the oil stops, when you stop. When you stop pouring out, when God's blessings that he's given to you stops with you, God realizes I no longer can bless other people through that person, so I will find someone else to use. So if you want that miracle in your life, if you want that to overflowing in your life, here's the key, church. Just keep pouring out. And as you pour out, you will find there's more where that came from. God gives free refills. So keep pouring out, and God will keep filling you. And third and finally, your impact will be determined by your obedience. You see, the number of jars that they gathered was an indication of their faith. When they were told to gather those jars, they could have gathered just a few because they realized there's no way that that little jar of oil would be able to fill more than one of those. They could have just gathered a couple or one or two, but because they had great faith and obedience to what God was instructing them to do, They were able to see God do what he wanted to do. You see, the number of jars, as it was an indication of their faith, when we have the attitude, God, I can only do this much, or I know, God, you're only going to take me this far. I know, God, I, I won't be able to accomplish that, so why even try? We will limit what God wants to do in our lives because we're focused on our own inability I recognize you and I only have so much to pour out, so much to give before we run out. But God has a never-ending supply. And sometimes God will take us to a point in our lives where he has to empty us of ourselves completely before we can be filled with him totally. And so sometimes in our lives we'll get to a point where I don't know how this is going to work out. I don't know how this is going to happen. I don't know. I have nothing more to give. And God says, perfect. Come to me like that and watch what I will do. And so we realize the impact that we have and seeing God do what he wants to do through our lives will be determined by our faith and our obedience in what God says for us to do. God, I know you want me to serve you in ministry, but, but God, I don't have that much time. God, I know I'm supposed to be giving you financially my tithes and even above and beyond that my offerings. God, I know I, I ought to be helping that other person and that person that's in need over there. God, but I have my own children. I have my own household responsibilities. I have my own job. I got the mother-in-law. I have the husband. Lord, I don't know how I'm supposed to do it all. And God says, as long as you keep pouring out, I'll keep pouring in. God says, if you pour out in the Spirit, by the Spirit, through the Spirit, I will, through my Spirit, work through you. And so if you want to see God fill you and flow through you to overflowing church, just keep pouring out because there is more where that came from. Yes, there are great needs, great demands, but God has a greater supply in Jesus' name, and my God will supply all your needs in Christ Jesus. Father, we thank you so much for your love and for your grace and for your mercy. Lord, I thank you so much for what you've done and what you're doing. And Lord, I understand as heads are bowed and eyes are closed, there's people all around this room who feel empty, perhaps have found themselves at a place where they don't feel like they can give anymore. 
to do anymore. But God, we realize today that you are our perpetual source. That you promised to fill us to overflowing. And so, Lord, I pray for every single person here in this room. Lord, that you would fill each and every single person to be able to equip them and enable them to do all that you've set before them to do. And with heads bowed and eyes closed, maybe there's even some here today who have felt empty. Maybe you've tried to fill that void in your life. Maybe you've tried to find that satisfaction from what the world has to offer. You've tried the alcohol, but that left you feeling more empty. You've tried the drugs, but after the high, you're lower than ever before. You've tried the sexual exploits, and that left you feeling empty. You've tried the money, but that left you feeling empty. And the reason why is God has created you with only one thing that can truly, fully fill you, and that is his spirit, the oil in our lives. And as heads are bowed and eyes are closed, I wonder if there's some here today that would say, you know what, I want the spirit of God in my heart, in my life. I'm tired of being empty, and I want to be filled. If you're here today and you would say, you know what, I want that. I want to be satisfied. I want to be fulfilled. Listen, that can only come by surrendering your life to Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ came. He gave his life. He died on the cross for your sins. He paid the penalty and price for your sins so that you wouldn't have to. So as he offers forgiveness for your sins, a free gift to anyone who would simply believe in him and accept him as their Lord and Savior. God is making this available to you today. All you have to do is open your life to him. The Bible says, Jesus speaking, I stand at the door and knock. If any man, any person would open that door, I will come in and dine with him. That's commune with him, have a close relationship with them. Maybe even now, you sense God knocking on the door of your heart. Even now, you sense, you know what, you know that you're not right with God. You know it's time to get right with God, and God's saying, come home. I want to do what nothing else can do. I want to fill you. I want to forgive you. I want to restore you. And if that's you today, and you want to know that your sins are forgiven, you want to know that you're going to go to heaven, and you want to know that you can live this life fully filled the way that God has created you to live this life, I want to give you an opportunity this morning to give your life to Jesus Christ. As heads are bowed and eyes are closed, if that's you today and you would say, today's the day, I want to know that I'm forgiven. I want to be made right with Christ Jesus. I want to lead you in a very simple prayer of giving your life to Jesus Christ. And if you would like me to lead you in that prayer today, I want you right now, wherever you're at, just to raise up your hand high, just to hold it up. There's hands raised all around the sanctuary right now as heads are bowed and eyes are closed. As you're raising your hand right now, I'm going to ask for you to do something in just a moment. In just a moment, I'm going to ask for you to stand to your feet. And right now, you might think, okay, I'm going to put my hand down. I, I'm not going to come forward. I'm not going to do that. Because Satan right now is telling you, don't do this. You don't need this. I want you to leave here the same way that you came in, broken and defeated. But God wants you to leave here today fully filled with the Spirit. And so on the count of three, I'm going to ask for you to do something. I'm going to ask for you to stand to your feet. I'm going to lead you in a prayer. So on the count of three, I want you to stand. If you raised your hand, even if you didn't, I want you to stand to your feet. One, Jesus loves you. Two, he's died for you. Three, stand to your feet and receive the forgiveness of sin he's offering to you. Praise the Lord. If you're standing to your feet right now, I'm going to ask the team to lead us in one short stanza. Just enough time to give you time to make your way out of the aisle and come forward. And I want to lead you in this prayer of surrendering your life to Jesus Christ. So as they play, I want you to come now as they lead us in this song. Come now. Really? 
there is no way you make a way Where no one else can reach us You find us Where there is no way you make a way Where no one else can reach us You find us Where there is no way you make a way You find us where there is no way you make a way Where no one else can reach us You find us Maybe at one point in your life you've given your life to the Lord But you know right now you're far from where you ought to be with Him You know you've walked away from Him And God would be telling you today as his son, his daughter, come home. You know that that road leads to destruction. There's nothing left there. Come home. Maybe you're holding on right now and you're thinking, I, I don't know how I, I, I can come back to the Lord after what I've done. I don't know how he'll ever forgive me. Listen, God is waiting with open arms to welcome you home. All you have to do is receive him, come back to him, and he'll welcome you in. He'll love you. He'll care for you. He'll forgive you. He'll restore you. But he won't knock down the door of your heart. He's waiting for you to open your heart, and you do that by standing now. I'm going to ask the team to lead us in one more short stanza, short chorus. And I believe there's still someone holding out, holding on. Today's the day of salvation. Come and experience all that God has for you today. Get your life right with Jesus. Listen, God knows where you're at. The church might not, people around you might not, but you know where you're at. But more importantly, God knows where you're at. Receive what God wants to give you today. Be obedient. Stand to your feet. And receive him as your Lord and Savior. As we sing this, come now. Where there is no way you may Where no one else can reach us You find us Where there is no way you make a way Where no one else can reach us You find us Where there is no way you make a way Where no one else can reach us Bible says that there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. All the old has passed away. Behold, all things become new. And it doesn't matter where you're from. It matters where you're going. And I want to lead you in a very simple prayer of accepting Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and committing or recommitting your life to following closely with him. So I'm gonna ask for you now to bow your heads and to repeat this prayer out loud. I'm gonna ask for the church to surround you in this prayer by also repeating this prayer. Would you say this, Lord Jesus, forgive me of my sins and fill me with your Holy Spirit. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for dying for me. I give you my life. Take me. Use me for your plans, for your purposes, and for your glory. I will walk with you all the days of my life. I love you. Thank you for loving me. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Now listen, the decision that you just made the Bible says that even one comes to salvation and to repentance, all of heaven is rejoicing. 
you can guarantee there's a huge party going on right now in heaven. And we rejoice with you and people clap because they, they've stood here before you in months and the years before you and they know the power of the Holy Spirit, what happens when we surrender our lives to the Lord. And I want to let you know this decision that you've made today is the best decision of your life. I hope that you back me up when I say that, church. Best decision of your life. But, but you may say, now what? You know, what, what do I do now? You know, I made this step. I've come forward. I've committed my life to the Lord. But now what? Uh, the church here has put together some materials, a, a small packet of some things they want to give to you that will help you in this, what the Bible calls a walk with God. It's our journey through life with God. And so we want to help you in these formative steps to give you that, that right start in the right direction, some steps to take that will help strengthen you in this commitment that you've now made to follow after the Lord. We want to give you a Bible if you don't own a Bible. And so right now we have some men, some women available that want to give you some things. Right now, would you wave your hand right here? See the guy with the beard? That's what I'm going for one day by faith. <laughs> but right here, uh, he's going to lead you out this way. So would you just turn, uh, your stuff will be okay. Your friends will wait for you. Just right now, would you follow him out? They want to give you some materials before you go your way today. Church, would you stand to your feet? Would you put your hands together? Let's celebrate what God has done today in the hearts and the lives of his people. Keep them going, church. Keep them going all the way out. Praise God. Praise God. Would you bow your heads with me? Father, you realize that, and we realize today that we can't, but we also acknowledge today that you can through the power of the Holy Spirit. And as heads are bowed and eyes are closed, as there's believers all around this sanctuary recognizing, Lord, that we have a need for you in a greater way, I want to pray for each of you today who would just ask for God to fill you afresh, overflowing. I want you right now, wherever you're at, just to raise up your hand, and I want to pray just a fresh anointing and empowering of the Holy Spirit upon your life. Just hold your hand up. And Lord, as you see these hands that are raised, but more importantly, Lord, you see their hearts. And you know the needs. God, I pray that you would pour out your Spirit in such a powerful way Lord, that we would be empowered to do all that you would call us to do. That we would never limit you, God, on what you could do because we look at what we can't do. Help us to fix our eyes upon you, the author and finisher of our faith. And Lord, now strengthen us by your spirit. Overflow in us with your spirit so that we could leave this place today, Lord, being willing to overflow out of us and to fill vessels all around us. Lord, we pray that you would pour out your blessings upon this church and this congregation and that you would use this place as a catalyst for revival throughout our land because there's so many people that are filled with your spirit that are filling empty vessels around them. And Lord, would we see a work of your spirit unlike anything we've ever seen before. And we thank you, Lord, for your spirit our helper. We depend upon your spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people say, amen.